So who is Jesus? And why will so many people celebrate his, <coughs> excuse me, celebrate his birthday in a few weeks? Every year, millions of people decorate their homes and throw parties and spend lots of money on presents. Businesses and governments shut down. And it all revolves around the birth of this man. Last year, Money Magazine gave a rundown on holiday spending. Listen to this. Americans spend $86 on Halloween. I think that's growing. $134 on Father's Day. That made me feel good. For Mother's Day, it's $186, which if you're a dad, that seems about right, all right? But the runaway winner is Christmas at $795. In fact, this year, it's gonna be over $1,000. It comes to three quarters of a trillion dollars that we'll spend on a holiday celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's amazing. What could be so compelling about a man who lived 2,000 years on the other side of the world in a sleepy little Middle Eastern country? Why would his birth split history into two parts and divide people's lives into before and after? Some of the greatest architectural achievements in Europe were built for his worship, and I want to go to this one. This one's in Barcelona. It's the Gaudi uh, Sagrada Familia. Some of the most beautiful art was created in his honor. Some of the world's most beautiful music was written in his praise. How could one human being uh, be so captivating that the most powerful nation of his day would crucify him and three centuries later acknowledge him as the only god of the Roman Empire? An Englishman who encountered him suddenly realized that all men and women are created equal in his image and spent his entire political career in this man's name, bringing an end to slavery in the British Empire. A Yugoslavian girl gave her life to comfort the dying in Calcutta, India for his sake. People from all walks of life say he saved them from drugs, depression, and hopelessness. In his name, people feed the hungry and house the homeless and clothe the poor, build hospitals to heal the sick, create ministries to protect the lives of innocent babies, and once again, to abolish slavery and sex trafficking. Here we are, 6,400 miles from where he lived, 2,000 years later, and it's still his name people prefer to use in cursing. The guy who smashes his thumb with a hammer. It's not just a timber lake. <laughs> a golfer misses a putt. They never say an Oprah Winfrey, you know. <laughs> Jesus' name is mocked more than ever today. His followers are increasingly persecuted. At this moment, 215 million Christians are suffering because of their faith in it. The question of the hour, especially for the church, is who is Jesus? As we're ramping up for the Christmas season, I wanna take these next few weeks to talk about what should be obvious. Jesus Christ is God. He's our creator, and he did the unthinkable. He humbled himself to become one of us. As a human being, he lived a perfect life, died an excruciating death on a Roman cross, and it was all for our sins. He died in our place and then rose again from the dead as the firstborn of a new creation race of humans. It was, the, it was the price of our adoption. That's how much he values relating to us. That's how much he wants us close. I want him to be more than a historical figure in the Bible to us. I want, I want Jesus to become so living and real that he wrecks our hearts with who he is and how he feels about us. So let's just stop right here. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to do that very thing. God, I'm asking you right now, would you come close and do what you love to do? Would you reveal Jesus to us? Would you open the eyes of our understanding, of our hearts today? Only you can reveal the spiritual reality of what we're talking about here. Show us Jesus. We wanna see the beauty and the glory and the humility of this man who is seated on the throne of heaven at the Father's right hand. Melt our hearts, melt the coldness in us with a revelation of who he is and how he feels about us. 
We're asking you today, right now, in this place, transform us as only you can. Give me utterance to speak your words. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, so Jesus forgives, he saves, he heals, he protects, he provides, but he's way more. In his own words, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only door to heaven. He is the source of every good and perfect gift. The apostle John sees him after the resurrection and is so overwhelmed, he falls in a dead faint at his feet. I mean, this was one of Jesus' closest friends. He leaned on his chest during uh, the Last Supper, and yet he is undone by Jesus' glory. Jesus is beautiful beyond anything we can imagine. His presence is breathtaking. And here's, here, here's what I didn't learn growing up in church. This is the stuff nobody taught me. He longs to reveal himself to us and to draw us into that reality, but only to the degree that we keep knocking, seeking, and asking for it. So my goal in this is to spark hunger in us for more revelation of this man with fire in his eyes and a burning heart of love who yearns to relate to us. Because I am convinced that knowing him better is the key to loving him more. There's nothing that transforms the human heart more than seeing Jesus. When God reveals God to us, it kicks us out of boredom and depression and anxiety and guilt and compromise any other dark thing that could mess us up. The Apostle Paul, is the premier example of this. He has a dramatic encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus while his name was still Saul. The guy was, I mean, he not only hated Christians, he was literally hunting them down to kill them. That was the mission he was on. Acts 9.3 says, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Jesus gives him a new name, a new mission, and the hater immediately is transformed, becomes a lover, taking the news of Jesus to the non-Jewish world. That's why we're here today, because of This transformation that happened in this man. Man, this was Paul's explanation of what happened when he's talking to the church in Philippi. He said, I gave up everything to obey him. I sacrificed many things to do what he asked, and here's why. Because of the excellence of the knowledge of this man. He's saying, you have no idea what he's like. When you encounter the magnificence of this risen human, nothing else matters. Everything becomes worthless by comparison. Now I want you to hear how he states this in our own vernacular. I'm gonna read this from the message paraphrase so that you know, it's, it's more down to our lingo. This is not the infatuated talk of a new believer. The longer Paul knows Jesus, you're gonna see this, the more he's ramping up. So this is Philippians 3, verse eight. He says, all things, all the things that I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once, I thought I had going for me is insignificant dog dung. (laughs) That sort of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? I've dumped it all in the trash so that I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in your suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. 
Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eyes on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those you see running this same course, headed for this same goal. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. I've warned you of them many times. Sadly, I'm having to do it again. All they want is easy street. They hate Christ's cross. But easy street's a dead-end street. Those who live there make their bellies their God. All they can think of is their appetites. This is a bad verse to be reading after Thanksgiving, isn't it? <laughs> well, we're getting off that track, right? All of us. The, the leftovers are ended, all right? <laughs> all they think of is their appetites, but there's far more to life for us. We're citizens of high heaven. We're waiting for the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own. He'll make us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which he's putting everything as it should be under and around him. This does not sound like a retiree, does it? I mean, this guy is, I mean, he is going for it. He's getting more intense as he grows older. Here's the bottom line. I really believe if we can see Jesus the way Paul saw him, we can live for Jesus the way Paul did. His love was white hot, and that's what I want for all of us. Read the book of Acts. You'll see that most of the first century church was captivated by Jesus, and their lives were vibrant and full of serving and giving and worship. They were seeking and asking for more revelation, and they lived literally expecting Jesus to return at any moment. I'm convinced if we will keep praying Paul's prayer, asking for the Spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus, that's where our hearts will go as well. We will not get out of this ditch of addiction and lethargy and boredom that the church is in right now until we start seeing Jesus rightly. That's, that's what's behind our lack of responsiveness to him right now. It's why we feel sluggish and stuck in all kinds of bad behaviors. We lack revelation in the personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, Paul says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us. How's he done it? By his Spirit. By his Spirit. The Holy Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, and the point he's making is he's here to show it to us. He wants us to see these things. That's available to every one of us right now. It's what energized Paul to live the way he lived. When he saw Jesus, everything was worthless. Everything else, everything but that. Let me assure you, the Holy Spirit has not retired. I mean, he is still just as willing and active to reveal Jesus to us now as he was then. In John 16, 13, Jesus said, he'll guide you into all truth. He's gonna take the truth and he's gonna guide you into it. He'll take you step by step into all the truth that you'll seek him for. But he'll only give us what we're hungry to see, what we're hungry to know. I, if I'm satisfied and distracted and entertained, he'll wake me up. My degree of hunger really does determine my degree of revelation. If you're satisfied just being forgiven and that's all you want, that's all you'll get. But there's so much more. Oh, there's so much more. The Holy Spirit knows so much more about Jesus than we can even imagine. In John 16, 14, Jesus said, he will glorify me. And there are a number of ways that he does that. But the best is when he just gobsmacks us with the wonder and fascination of who Jesus is. That's what he meant by he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit will honor Jesus by taking 
these multiple aspects of his beauty and majesty and character and literally blow our minds with it. But Jesus said, you gotta keep asking. You gotta keep knocking, you gotta keep seeking. When I uh, got desperate a few years back to get free from you know, a big old food addiction, Leon Harris gave me some incredible advice. He said, Ron, you're eating because your body is starving. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, Leon, I don't know. I'm wearing like times two the big men's clothes. You know, I'm, I'm having to go sh really shopping nowadays to even have it. I don't know whether I'm, he said, no, trust me. He said, you're, you're just hanging that stuff, your body's just hanging that stuff on you. You're, you're really starving to death for nutrients. He said, you got toxic hunger happening because the food you're eating has so few nutrients in it. So he encouraged me, just start doing one thing. He said, begin the day with a green drink. And he can lay this out for you incredibly well. But the result was almost miraculous. By adding that green drink, my body suddenly was getting nutrition and slowly I was able to get that toxic hunger under control. And I, in fact, the, the amazing thing to me was I actually started wanting nutritious food. We try to do it backwards. We try to go on a starvation diet and we end up right back where we started. Well, the same principle works spiritually. My brilliant mind thinks the only way to resolve my addiction to entertainment and social media and video games and one more adrenaline rush is to deprive myself, is to you know, spend hours in sensory deprivation or join a monastery. What I really need is a revelation of Jesus. That's what my soul is craving. And the Holy Spirit is ever present to make that happen if I'll keep asking him for it. Right now, we got a fake food, counterfeit Jesus addiction happening in this country. He's being presented as the God who's out to make your life better. It's why the church is sick and lethargic. A self-help Jesus isn't gonna fix what's wrong with us. Paul said the same thing was happening in his day. Men were preaching, quote, another Jesus. That's 2 Corinthians 11, 4. I see more and more leaders backing off from the teaching of Jesus in Scripture. <laughs> and it's easy to know why. If you've read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was not wishy-washy. I mean, some leaders are even claim, uh, denying his claims to be God, saying, oh, he was a great teacher, but his teachings offer just one of many ways to heaven. I mean, it's shocking stuff. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the only door to God. So <laughs> you can't say he was a good teacher. He was either crazy or he was telling the truth, that he is the door to God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Counterfeit Jesus has no power to transform a human heart. And that's why we're not seeing the power of God in this generation like we, we have in past generations. This is all the lead up to a great falling away that Paul and Jesus predicted. Uh, places like 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Even genuine believers are gonna be deceived by this. There's, there's coming a global worship movement that will include miracles in Jesus' name among others but the whole thing will be counterfeit. It's all spelled out in the book of Revelation. I mean, we wanna be on this. We wanna be aware of where this is going. Now is the time to lock into the Jesus of Scripture, this magnificent man who is coming back with fire in his eyes and a burning heart of love to bring about justice and rule the earth with a rod of iron. Now's the time to answer the question that he posed to his own disciples in Matthew 16, 13. He said, who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus sits them down one night and he asks, who, who are people saying that I am? Imagine you're sitting around the campfire listening. One of them says, they, they, they think you're John the Baptist. John is, you know, at this point, had just been killed by Herod. Jesus said, why do they think that? Well, you're a fiery holiness preacher who's fearless with the truth. I mean, you don't care who it offends. That was certainly John's MO. Another said, the people I talk to think you're Elijah. He was the bigger in life Old Testament prophet who took on the priest of Baal, calling down fire from heaven to consume a sacrifice that he had waterlogged. I mean, it even melted the rocks 
And then Elijah takes the sword and single-handedly kills all the false priests. This guy's saying, people see you as a prophet with power. You stopped storms and raised dead people and cast out demons. You fed a multitude the other day with a little boy's lunch. You're a lot like Elijah. Another says, the people I talk to think you're the weeping prophet Jeremiah, the man characterized by compassion. They saw how you dealt with that woman caught in adultery the other day. You were so tender with her, saving her from the religious guys who were bent on stoning her to death and forgiving her sin. Jesus said, that's true, I am a tender shepherd. I'm also a supernatural prophet like Elijah and a holiness preacher like John. Then he looks at them in Matthew 16, 15 is the verse you wanna underline, highlight, circle, and star, because the whole church is built on this one. Who do you say I am? This is the number one question of the hour in any generation. Who do you think he is? How you answer that will determine all kinds of issues in your life. Peter speaks up in verse 16, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Messiah or anointed one is the Hebrew there. And by using Christ or Messiah, Peter wasn't just saying you're the one who comes who's come to forgive our sins. He's saying you are the savior of the world. All the Old Testament prophecies are about you. You are fully human, fully God. You are the bridegroom, king, and judge that we've waited a couple millennia to see. You're God in human flesh. And Jesus said, you're right, Peter. And let me tell you something. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Matthew 16, 17, he says, you didn't get that from a Bible study or a preacher. This came by supernatural revelation. The only way you get the true knowledge of Jesus is by illumination. The Holy Spirit has to reveal it to you. It's supernatural. It's God revealing God to us. Verse 18, Jesus says, on this rock. Now, we get that wrong when we think he meant Peter. The rock is the revealed truth of who he is, fully God, fully man. On this rock, I will build my church. The church can only be built on the truth of who Jesus is, not just the doctrine of forgiveness. Obviously, that's, that's a big deal. It's critical, but that's only the introduction. I love the quote uh, from A.W. Tozier that Wes used a couple, few weeks back. He said, what, co what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now maybe up till now it's been a fairly short list, like God made a world and forgives sin and sometimes answers prayer, but you haven't really thought that much about it. Tozier said, when the church lacks the knowledge of God, they're not able to resist temptation. They think they have to try harder when what they need is to see better. That little tweak, that has changed my life. Because I've discovered the harder I try, the worse I get. Have you seen that in yourself? I mean, I, uh, what changes me is seeing Jesus. When I see the beauty and the glory and the compassion and the tenderness of this man, everything pales by comparison. The reason I want to see Jesus better is because I'm terrible at resisting sin and darkness when I'm not. A bad day, you know, last week. I'm studying all week and I'm making no progress and I'm frustrated and anxious, kind of depressed. And later I'm talking to the Holy Spirit about it. Like, what's up? You know, I've, I've spent the whole day and I'm just, seems like I'm taking, you know, three steps forward and two steps back. And just as clear as if I'd heard it audibly, I just sensed these words come to me. Next time, Try doing this with me rather than for me. <laughs> I mean, it was like a gut punch. It was like, oh. I mean, that makes all the difference in the world. I realized that I had jumped into study that morning. I had a whole lot on the, my plate. I jumped into study without connecting. And I mean, I could just look back and go, yeah, you're right. I got more anxious all during the day. And, and, and instead of stopping, I'm thinking, no, 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 Lord, I got, I got to get this done. <laughs> I was going, this is just, you know, you're going nowhere, Ryan. You're on a treadmill. Just, just stop, stop, stop. Talk to me. 
When I'm seeing what Paul saw, I find I can live like Paul lived. It's not an issue of doing or willpower, it's an issue of seeing because there's this dynamic connection between what I'm seeing and how I'm responding. Most important question you'll ever answer is who is Jesus? What do you think he's like? What do you see? And again, I I think most people would say, "I, I don't really think about him that much. You can change that right here, right now. You can reset your heart to make knowing Jesus your greatest ambition and number one lifelong pursuit. Because that's a choice only you can make. And the moment you do that, the Holy Spirit will jump in and say, now we're talking. I'm with you, I'm on it, I'm gonna help you. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11, Paul describes how the church functions. Listen to this, he says, Christ himself, gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. It's an ongoing process until we all reach unity in the faith and in what? There it is. I mean, there it is right there, the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. It's the personal knowledge of the Son of God that causes us to mature. And it's a lifelong journey of discovery. We're wanting to see the endless facets of his magnificent beauty till we are literally filled with the knowledge of who he is. This is the greatest need in the church today. And the Bible clearly spells out how we're to go after it. I remember when somebody pointed this out to me when I was a young guy. They said, if you want to find the knowledge of God, And I even thought that sounded weird. They said, you you have to find the knowledge of God. But here's the way to do it, all right? It's in Proverbs chapter two, and it's the first five verses. Now I'm gonna have us read this together, ready? We'll have it on the screen, right there, you got it? If you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. I mean, that's, that's all out pursuit that we just read about. So we start with his words. It's not like some treasure hunt in the jungles of Borneo. This is like an Easter egg hunt for three-year-olds. I mean, God's hidden his stuff in plain sight. It's like, oh man, there they all are, you know, laying out there in the field. Most of us have multiple copies of it in, in, in several translations. Number one, I just simply read the Bible. Every year I follow a Bible reading plan. It gets me through the entire book. And I do it because I want to receive his words to me. I wanna let them saturate my brain. Right now, I'm, you know, it's in the dark usually when I wake up and I'm listening to it. It's unbelievable how the simple practice of just reading the word of God has changed my perspective and has kept me out of the ditch. I mean, that's, that's one way I treasure his commands. Number two, I meditate on it. By, by taking a passage, maybe a sentence or single phrase, maybe just a word, I think about it. And it, this is not like reading the back of a cereal box. You know, these are God's words to me. They reflect his heart and his wisdom. So I, I, I take time, I, I force myself, think about what you're reading, right? And I'm reading the Gospel of Matthew, and it says Jesus saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and followed him. If my brain's engaged, I'll st- stop and go, wait, wait, what, what just happened? I mean, two words, and a guy walks away from a lucrative career? And the other part is, in that day, tax collectors were crooks. So this is like a 180 degree turn. Something compelling had to have happened to this guy for him to leave his whole life behind. You know, what made him following Jesus seem like a way better deal? And why do I follow? Think about the time I felt so lost and alone in basic training in the army and how he came close and he called my name and how it totally changed my life. I came back and my friends went, who are you? I think about all the times he keeps pulling me out of the darkness and assuring me that my weak love moves his heart. Just thinking about Matthew's story, 
moves me to worship. Another way I treasure God's word is to memorize it, which gives the Holy Spirit supernatural material to encourage me and comfort me and instruct me and guide me and warn me and strengthen me with it. Can't even tell you how often the words that I memorized as a young guy come back to me in an entirely new light. Sometimes in the middle of the night when anxiety's got me by the throat, I'll hear the words of Jesus, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not the kind that comes by transcendental meditation. This is the peace that passes all human understanding. The Bible's loaded with these multifaceted diamonds of truth that we'll be discovering for millions of years. We'll be studying and learning and growing in the knowledge of God in the next, in, in the age to come. I ask for insight, that's number four. And I don't just do it once in a five second all purpose prayer either. Sometimes I'll do it as I'm actually reading a verse. I'll dial down, I'll ask God, show me what this means. It's the R in the trust prayer list, release revelation. All through the day, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, open the eyes of my understanding, reveal truth. I'll ask him to show me what a specific verse means, how it applies to me. It's more than just reading, underlining, moving on. I'm asking the author for revelation. You guys remember that crazy TV episode, Lost, the Lost series? I ended up more lost when that thing ended than when it began. I mean, I got more lost every episode. I didn't know what had happened. And I was talking to other people and their idea of what had happened was even crazier than mine. And I watched the whole stupid thing. But then one day, mysteriously, the two geniuses that put this whole thing together were on TV talking and explaining the storyline. I thought, where were you guys when this whole thing was going on and everybody was you know, off on a different track? You, know, you could have cleared up all kinds of confusion. Well, think about that in light of the Bible. I mean, Jesus said these words, you're not gonna know what they mean. They're spirit and they're life. We seriously need the author's input if we're ever gonna understand them. So why doesn't the Holy Spirit just do it? Come on, I'm reading the book. Because he wants the interaction. <laughs> that was a new idea, really? Yeah, I want you to ask me about it. I want you to talk to me. He's after the relationship. And if he didn't wait for me to ask, I would never talk to him other than when I'm in desperate trouble. So he says, I'm here to reveal this to you. I know all the answers. Oh, I know so much about Jesus. I want to show you. Just keep asking me to release revelation and watch what happened. I'm doing that at five this morning. I'm laying there. I'm asking for this. I've gotten stirred up again. I can tell you, those little glimpses that I keep getting are energizing my soul. There is a man on the throne of heaven who knows my name and is coming back for me, and I want to know him. I want to have my heart wrapped around the kingdom he's bringing. I don't want to know everything there is to know about every situation that's going on in the Middle East and everywhere else in the world and miss this. This is the answer. This guy's got the answer. He knows how to fix what's wrong with the world. And he's coming. Yeah. <laughs> he's coming, guys. I mean, this is all the setup. He said these things would happen. All right, now persevere, number five. And when I've done that, I persevere some more. I try to commit for a decade at a time to find the knowledge of God. Verse four says, seek for it as silver. Search for it like hidden treasure. You know, what, say I could convince you that we have hid a billion dollars worth of gold bullion in this building. Someone. And if you find it in the next year, you can have it. You can keep all of it. What would you do? You would tear this place apart. You would absolutely tear this place apart. You would set up camp. You would refuse to go home and probably wouldn't eat most days. I mean, you, well, the Bible says in Colossians 2, 3, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Isn't he worth that kind of pursuit? Isn't he worth the investment of your time, your talent, your treasure? Paul says, I'm telling you, all the other stuff I pursued was worthless refuse. 
Here's my challenge. Christmas is coming. With all the busyness of the season, it's gonna end up being all about you and you're gonna come out empty again. You're gonna look back and go, what was that all about? Christmas is about God becoming one of us. So this week, I'm not gonna give you a bunch of stuff. Just try to start every day with the green drink of the real Jesus. Get the analogy? Start it with the green drink of the real Jesus. Start the day focused on him. I mean, just get some real nutrition in you. God, I wanna see you. I wanna know you. If you're not already finishing a Bible reading plan, pick one of the four Gospels and just start reading a chapter, maybe even a half, asking the Holy Spirit, reveal it, show me what this means, how it applies to my life. It's, again, the R and the trust perilous. And then when something catches your attention, stop and think about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to shine more light on it. Remember, Paul says, I sacrificed many things to do what he asked me because of the excellence of the knowledge of this man. You wanna know him because of the magnificence of who he is. If you wanna live like Paul lived, you gotta see what Paul saw about Jesus. Forgiveness is free, but gaining access to the deep things of God's heart will cost you something. So if Jesus is valuable to you, I, man, I wish somebody had poked me in the chest and told me this when I was a young guy. If he's valuable to you, go after him. Pursue him with everything you've got. There will never be a moment in eternity that you look back and will be sorry that you missed an episode of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> or you will be so sorry that you missed the new Lion King movie premiere to be here for church or a prayer meeting. Nothing in your life compares to the value of knowing Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is waiting for you to ask him. When we stand before the throne of God, I don't want a single one of you to look over at me and say, why didn't you tell us? Because I'm telling you right now, there is nothing in your life that compares with the value of knowing this man. He is so worthy of your devotion. He is so worthy of the pursuit. Be here every weekend this next month. Just determine right now, you can do it. You can just say, that's it, I'm, I'm showing up every weekend here at church. We're gonna talk, Ron's gonna talk about Jesus, I'm, gonna, I'm in. Be your own, find a prayer meeting you can attend. We, every Thursday we meet down the foundry from 12 to two. And that's our fast day, that's our day to go without food and say, God, you are worth this. Alternate Sundays we meet, well, this, this month we're gonna meet down at the foundry because they're changing up everything here for the Christmas event. I'm sure, you know, there are some of you sitting here who have no idea what I'm even talking about. The idea of personally encountering a resurrected human being who is sitting on the throne of heaven, that is a totally new idea. But that is the essence of the gospel. Somebody shortchanged you. They didn't tell you what this was about. That is the gospel. Jesus Christ is not a religious leader. He is the God-man who came to earth as one of us. He lived a sinless life. He died in our place so he could be right in making us right. So he could stay righteous in giving us the gift of righteousness. You can receive right now, right here, the love that he's offering you and let him give you the gift of eternal life. That's all you have to do. Put your trust in Jesus Christ to forgive your sin and save you from hell. You can do that right now. I've had several, recur I've had a recurring dream that is so lucid and it's me just saying what I just said and seeing the light come on in people's heart. I'm telling you, the gospel that I just proclaimed to you is the power of God to save your soul. It will change you permanently. We all, most of us sitting here can remember the day it happened to us. It can happen to you right now, in this moment. Right now, in this moment. I'm gonna have you stand with me and we're just gonna bow our heads together. And I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer to do this very thing. 
Because I'm telling you what happened, the light came on for a bunch of you today. I mean, something happened inside you and you go, I'm getting this. I, I, I am not used to getting things in church, but I'm getting this. I'm understanding, you know what, what's happening? The Holy Spirit is revealing Jesus to you. And this can be a total watershed moment of change for you, where everything is different. So I'm just gonna pray this prayer out loud. I want you just to echo it, all right? I'll, I'll pray it slow enough so you can just say these words back to God. Just say, God, I believe what the Bible says about Jesus. That he is your son. That he became a human. And he died in my place to remove all of my sin and to give me the gift of eternal life. I acknowledge my sin before you now. I acknowledge the brokenness in my soul. I repent and I turn to you and I receive your love and I receive your forgiveness and I invite you to come and live in me. Right now, I am choosing to follow you. I'm confessing you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now I'm gonna pray for you. God, make that real. Make that real. Let that miracle right now of supernatural spirit regeneration happen in the hearts of people right here, right now. I know it is. I know it is. You're close. You're here in this room. No, no one looking around right now. Just keep your eyes closed for a minute. How many of you, you prayed that prayer, maybe understanding it for the first time? I mean, it, it clicked. I, just raise your hand, all right? Raise your hand. I see hands going up all over the room. That's incredible. I mean, that will be, this will be the day you will look back on and remember that was the day. That was the moment. 